degree of respect for, uh, for Dan. He's, as you know, a good friend. If you, if you spend much time around uh, Dan and I, we're in the same room. Uh, there's quite a bit of friendly banter that goes back and forth, sarcasm, jabs, uh, so on. But there's um, several of you in this room um, that if something were to happen to you, I would weep bitterly. Um, but Dan has become one of those men, even though I've only known him about five years. And God has certainly used uh, this man to influence me. He's almost been a a mentor of sorts, even though I'm older than him, and he reminds me of that frequently um, with the old fart jokes and so on. So uh, I love this man dearly, and I'm looking forward to what he has to say. Dan, you want to come on up? And, uh, um, you know, for a while here, this, this little pulpit here re- resembled a workbench. There was just papers and stuff everywhere, and I'm like, well, it is. Uh, we have a, a godly man here who's going to do some work in the text of Scripture for us. So uh, let me pray, and then... Uh, We'll, uh, we'll hear what he has to say. Uh, gracious Father, thank you for, um, for the privilege uh, to be able to hear your word taught. Thank you, Lord, for the work that you have done in this man and that you have been uh, merciful and gracious uh, to, to, to Dan and his family. And thank you that he, you have made him a blessing to so many. And so, Lord, I ask that, uh, that your spirit uh, would be our teacher today that the Holy Spirit that you've graciously given Dan and gifted him as a teacher would instruct us and that we would be edified. We ask this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Need me to help you down the stairs? (laughs) If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Isaiah 6. So I am not preaching Isaiah 6, but I want to set the tone with... with, uh, Isaiah's encounter that Sean alluded to earlier. I thought it was funny earlier when Sean was doing his uh, intro for us. I wondered if he had taken my notes out of my Bible because it was right where I want to go this evening. So, um, Before I read this, uh, if you have ever taught or preached, would you raise your hand? Okay. So you know that moment where you can't breathe very well and your heart's pounding pretty good and palms are a little sweaty? Um, There, I feel a sense of intimidation this evening. Not because of you, because I love you guys. I know you guys. Um, But what I want to speak about, uh, I'm starting knowing I won't come close to what I want to communicate. So, let's go to Isaiah chapter 6 and look at verse 1. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two, he covered his face, and with two, he covered his feet, and with two, he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him, who called out while the house of God was filling with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined. For I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, Yahweh of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs, and he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, This has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. He said, Go and tell this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not know. 
Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull, their eyes dim, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and return and be healed. It's quite a ministry. Then I said, Lord, how long? And he said, until cities are devastated. And without inhabitant, houses are without people, and the land is devastated to desolation. And Yahweh has removed men far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. Yet there will be a tenth portion in it, and it will again be subject to burning like a terebinth or like an oak, whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that the men in this room have a desire to meet, to hear from your word tonight, Lord. And I pray what my brother Sean has asked, that, Lord God, you would encourage them, that Dan Mason would would just kind of fade, but the, the shepherd of their soul would profoundly touch their heart tonight that the word of God would be used by the power of God through the spirit of God and the sons of God tonight, Lord God. That my brothers would feel that, that, that wonderful twinge deep in, the, in their soul in awe of the king. A fresh awe be deeply in our thinking and in our hearts tonight, God, at who you are. For, Lord, you are holy. Bless this time, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so go ahead and turn to Isaiah 40. That's where we're going to be eventually. I want to read this little intro here as we move into what I want to share with you. This is from Pastor Mark Dever at Capitol Hill Baptist Church uh, in Washington, D.C. I had made a statement in a doctrinal seminar about God. Bill responded politely but firmly that he liked to think of God rather differently. For several minutes, Bill painted a picture for us of a friendly deity. He liked to think of God as being wise, but not meddling. Compassionate, but never overpowering. Ever so resourceful, but never interrupting. This, said Bill in conclusion, is how I like to think about God. My reply was perhaps somewhat sharper than it should have been. Thank you, Bill, I said, for telling us so much about yourself. But we're concerned to know what God is really like, not simply about our own desires. You ever been there, brothers, where you've heard somebody in a Bible study class or somebody in a, in a church setting or perhaps from your own mouth My God would never be like that. Or I just could not bear to think of God like that. A.W. Tozer, classic statement. I'm sure you've read this, memorized this, you've heard of this. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. So here's where I'm coming from tonight. One of, if not the greatest, need for the Church of Jesus Christ right this moment is to have a right view of God. A true, biblical, right view of the living God. I believe that there is a plague running rampant in God's church all over the place of a weak, low view of God. Here's a couple of phrases that I wrote down that maybe these sound familiar to you. Maybe you've heard these. God is trying to get our attention. 
what God is trying to say is, God is so glad he has you on his team. I just don't know what is going to take what it is going to take for God to get a hold of this situation. <laughs> and one of my very personal favorites, well, I guess all we can do now is pray. The sovereign of the universe is our last resource. That makes sense. Sometimes I've heard folks say, God is begging for you to come and ask him into your heart. These are very common things that believers say, and I believe they are extremely revelatory of our view of God. It's a fascinating reality just how backwards we can see things. Throughout history, the church has struggled to uphold a high view of God, and yet it is so very common. And here's how it kind of works, and this is just fascinating to me as you look over the, 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 just the landscape at times of, of the church, professing church, that a high view of the Lord, so like a, a good, clear, biblical view of God, is always connected to a true biblical view of man. Where we see God as glorious, God as majestic, God as supreme. And then we look at ourselves and we go, mm -mm, not me. Flip that on its head and you'll see the, what is all over the place in our world, which is a very low view of the Lord and a very elevated view of man. The very opposite of what the scripture says. And so um, tonight, what's the burden on my heart for you this evening is that you and Dan would have just a fresh reminder. Because I, I don't come here tonight thinking that I'm telling you something that you don't know. I, I don't believe that. If so, then the Lord will, will use that. But I want to, be, by way of reminder, come to you and say, brothers, we must have a high view of God, and I would say an ever-increasing understanding of the greatness and majesty and glory of God. But the warning is the, greater you, the more you see him, the greater he'll become, and the more you see him and the greater he becomes, the more you'll see yourself rightly. Did you see in Isaiah 6? See what Isaiah did immediately? When he saw the Lord in all of his majesty and the angelic hosts and all of that, that glorious scene, the response to that is, I'm pretty good. God loves me and has a wonderful plan for my life, and he is so blessed to have a guy with these kinds of talents on his team. After all, my good works outweigh my bad works, blah, blah, blah. That, that whole line of thought is just blown apart when he sees God. It's just not, nothing like that. Isaiah says nothing good about himself when he sees God rightly. He, the, his immediate response is what? I'm ruined. <laughs> I'm, I'm ruined. I don't know why, brothers, particularly he goes to his lips. If there was something about his speech or something of that nature, it, it, the text doesn't say. But that's immediately where he goes and says, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I'm around a bunch of people in the same way. And so tonight I want to speak on the majesty, the glory, the holiness of God. Holiness is not a difficult word to, to get our arms around in the sense of what it means. Holy means to be set apart, different, totally other than all creation. God is not um, a, a, a little bit better than you are or a glorified you. He is holy, set apart, different, distinct. Now let's think about some of his perfections. The word of God, I believe with great clarity, speaks about the omniscience of God, knowing the beginning to the end, the Lord who is the all-knowing one. So he's omniscient. 
we also see that He is omnipresent. The Lord is everywhere. You cannot flee from Him. Just You can jot down Psalm 139 there as a reminder. Whereas the psalmist is saying, if I go here, you're there. If I go here, you're there. If I go here, you're there. I can't get away from you. You know everything, and you're everywhere. But he's also omnipotent. All power is his. He's also sovereign. Now, I'm not going to say all sovereign. I'm just going to say sovereign, because I think that cuts it. Because when you ask the question, but sovereign over what? Yep. You name it. You name it. Nebuchadnezzar is the one that says, nobody strikes his hand and says, what are you doing? Nobody does that. Now, brothers, I, I, I want to reiterate this and press it into your soul. Nobody says to God, what are you doing? He answers to no one. He is the sovereign one. All rule and authority is his. He does not ask permission. He is everywhere. He has all power. He knows everything. And he has sovereign rule over all things. It says that he's working all things after the counsel of his own will, Ephesians 1. He says he's working all things together according, or I'm not mixing the two, for good, for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Psalm 115, our God is in the heavens and he does whatever he pleases. That's, that's the word. That's the word. And so if anybody goes, well, I don't know what I think about that. I don't care. I don't, I, Dan Mason, I'm saying, I don't care. What does the text say? What does the text say? And really, what I'm saying when I say that is, what does God say? It's his word. It's not Dan. It's not some kind of ism or a particular theology that I just want to really badly push. I'm just saying, there's the text. God in his unbelievable grace and mercy through the most magnificent of stories, has preserved his word, and it's on your lap tonight. And we have the gall to say, I don't really like what it says about him. Are you kidding? Are you kidding me? I'm just going to run through this list. I'm not turning to any of these passages, because Sean has already alluded to some of them. It's totally robbed me of my thunder this evening, so. <clears throat> but you, <laughs> when, I first, when I first met Sean, I thought, this guy taught himself Greek in a log truck. We're going to be friends. <laughs> We're going to be friends. Adam, after his sin, where are you? Adam says, I'm, I'm scared. The very first time you see somebody want to hide from God. Abraham. Abraham, follow me. Okay, uh, where are we going? I'll tell you when we get there. I'm going to give a land to you. I'm going to give a seed of, of nations from you. All the families of the earth will be blessed through you. Now you leave your family and follow me to a land that I'll reveal to you. Okay. <laughs> and throughout the life of Father Abraham, we see him face to face with Almighty God and seeing the true, holy God. Moses. Moses is a tough nut to crack. God comes and says, I want you to come with me, and I want you to go, and you're going to speak on my behalf. Lord, I know you know everything, but you might have forgotten that I've got this talking problem. And the Lord says, I made your mouth. You're going. And he, that moment, brothers, where he comes before the burning bush, and he says, take off your sandals, for the ground you're standing on is holy ground. What made it holy? God made it holy. Aaron, one of the most chilling passages in the Old Testament, where Aaron's son's lives are taken. And Aaron has this fatherly 
anger and wrestle in his soul. And Moses says, those who come near him, remember God specifically speaking through Moses, those who come near me, I will be regarded as holy. And that little phrase, and Aaron held his peace. Why? Because the holiness of God trumped any kind of humanly indignation about the taking of his sons. His mouth shut. David. David is an interesting one. One that has the Lord before him so often. Sees the Lord as so holy and yet so close in such an intimate friendship. But even with his sin of Bathsheba, his sin with this woman that he takes and makes his and has her husband in the front of the line and he's slaughtered. And then the Lord says through Nathan, behold, you're the, you are the man. And David's response is not, nuh-uh. David goes before God and says, maybe he'll have mercy. You know what? The Lord still takes his son and he cleans up and comes away. And you go, what kind of a reaction is this reaction from David? The answer He sees God as holy. Saul, Acts chapter 9, where Jesus Christ himself, God incarnate, dead, buried, resurrected, and ascended, confronts this man on the way to destroy the church. And he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And you see this guy who is the quintessential leader, the strength of this group to destroy the people of the way, being led by the hand as a blind man, looking pathetic to anybody who could watch that. Why? Because he came in contact with the Holy One. And Isaiah. Isaiah and Isaiah chapter 6 is just one of the sweetest texts because here's a man who sees the Lord. We're told in John chapter 12 that he saw a pre-incarnate Christ and he is in awe of the majesty and glory of God. And he is in awe of his wretchedness simultaneously. Remember that classic passage, or that classic uh, series, The Holiness of God with R.C. Sproul, where he said, for the first time in his life, he knew who God was. And for the first time in his life, he knew who Isaiah was. Brothers, do you recognize the common thread that these men who come in contact with the Lord, are none of them are bored? None of them are lazy? None of them are, I mean, I'm not saying these are perfect men. We know that. But when they come in contact with the Holy One, they do not see him as weak. They do not see him as impotent. They do not see him as one who needs their help. They see him as the Holy One the set-apart one, the perfect one, perfect in knowledge, perfect in power. And they bow before him. Last one just to draw your attention to is Job. If anybody, if, if, if there is anyone you and I could think of where we would have sympathy pain for in reference to him coming before the Lord and saying, really, really this is what you brought We'd feel that for Job. And the Lord, in his divine wisdom, confronts that man. And his response, after losing everything, being covered in those blisters and all the horrible things that happened to him, the Lord says, where were you? Where were you? Where were you? Where were you? And Job says what? I put my hand over my mouth, and I will not say another word. Now, I don't know about you guys. That is a supernatural recognition of the holiness of God. Meaning, that is not how any of us would naturally react at the loss of our kids, at the loss of our, of our, of our goods, at the loss of our health. Everything stripped from us. And then his wife says, just curse him and die. Enough of this. I always found it interesting. The enemy never even sought to do away with her. Just saying. All right. Isaiah chapter 40. Um, As Isaiah works through this text, 
uh, as he speaks this. Really what he's doing here is he's bringing comfort to the people of God in exile, the Babylonian exiles here to encourage them. And what blows my mind about this text is that he doesn't encourage them necessarily by saying everything will be perfect for them. The way he encourages them is he points to the power and the greatness and the sovereignty of their God. Not of them, but of their God. And so I'm not going to expound this in great detail. I just want you guys to walk through this with me. Number one, verse one. Comfort, O comfort, my people, says your God. Speak to the heart of Jerusalem and call out to her that her warfare has been fulfilled, that her iniquity has been removed, that she has received from the hand of Yahweh double for all her sins. A voice is calling, prepare the way for Yahweh in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low and let the rough ground become a plain and the rugged terrain a broad valley. Then the glory of Yahweh will be revealed and all flesh will see it together for the mouth of Yahweh has spoken. A voice says, call out. Then he answered, what shall I call out? All flesh is grass and all its loving kindness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers and the flower fades when the breath of Yahweh blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Get yourself up on a high mountain, O Zion, bearer of good news. Rise up your voice powerfully, O Jerusalem, bearer of good news. Raise it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, behold, our God. Behold, Lord, Yahweh will come with strength, with his arm ruling for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him like a shepherd. He will shepherd his flock in his arm. He will gather the lambs and carry them in his bosom. He will gently lead the nursing ewes. Now, So there's the comfort, there's the kickoff. This is what he's going to do. Behold, here's our God coming. And then he pauses, or or rather, it's kind of a parenthesis, and he's going to give you a description of the Lord. So there's the cry of comfort, and now listen to what he says about your God. Who's measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? My daughter and I have been swimming in the ocean together out there playing this year. And I always try to keep a really good sharp eye on her because she has her father's um, gift for getting hurt. And when we're out there and those waves are crashing on us, I just keep keeping an eye on her. And we're not even out that that deep, but the, the waves and the power of just being out there. For some of you, I'm sure you've been out there, dory boats and that kind of stuff. And... There's something so shrinking of the ego out in the ocean. And the scripture says that God measures the waters in the hollow of his hand. Remember, this this kind of uh, artistic language, these word pictures are seeking to get across the nature of how vast and how great he is. And encompass the heavens by the span. And calculated the dust of the earth by the measure. And weighed the mountains in a balance. And the hills in a pair of scales. Who has encompassed the spirit of Yahweh. Or who, ha- who or as his counselor has informed him. With whom did he take counsel and who gave him understanding. And who taught him in the path of justice and taught him knowledge. And made him know the way of understanding, speaking to the omniscience, the the great wisdom of Almighty God, the absolute perfect wisdom of the King. So not only does he make all the waters of his creation look just dinky, tiny in the palm of his hand, but he asks no one for advice. God doesn't need you. He doesn't need your advice. That's a truth that At times, it kind of, at first, we're like, wait, wait, I I thought I was helping him. Well, he's using you, but he doesn't need you. 
He doesn't need you. Remember years ago, a pastor in a message said, God does not use you because he needs you. He uses you because he loves you. Look at 15. Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket. The nations <laughs> are like a drop in the bucket and are counted as a speck of dust on the scales. Behold, he lifts up the coastlands like fine dust. Even Lebanon is not, is not enough to burn, nor its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations, hear the language, brothers, all the nations are as nothing before him. They are counted by him as non-existent and utterly formless. I mean, <clears throat> the, uh, okay, so my dad had this old Capri station wagon when I was a kid, and we had a, a dusty driveway that we drove down where we, where we lived. And I remember one day in particular where my dad opened up the hood of the old dusty station wagon, and he took some compressed air from the air compressor with his little uh, extension and he blew it and all this dust just lifted and just left that vehicle. I've thought about that so many times in my Christian life where passages like this just blow all the dust off my soul in reference to God. Where I can become just dry, dusty in my life as a Christian. Where, where you just don't feel the zeal in your heart when you pick up the word, or a sermon, just it just your heart feels like flint at times. Where God, in a passage such as this, just puts that compressed air in there, all that dust just lifts. And the Lord says, okay, I'm giving you a fresh vision of me. I want you to have the freshest vision you have had in a long time of me, from a passage like this. So that way when you read, all the nations are as nothing, your response is not, what, what, what happened? Every single nation has nothing before him. What are we, ta who are we talking about here, guys? Which is fascinating, because that's what Isaiah says in the next verse. Look at 18. To whom, then, will you liken me? Or what likeness will you compare with me or with him? Now, he shows the uh, stupidity of idolatry here. As for the graven images, a craftsman casts it, a goldsmith plates it with gold, and a silversmith fashions chains of silver. He who is too impoverished to make such a contribution chooses a tree that does not rot. He seeks out for himself a wise craftsman to prepare a graven image that will not be shaken. You hear that? He's saying, so what would you liken me to? And in this idolatrous culture, the answer is, um, we would get somebody with some steel and do some melting and some building and hammering, and then we would... We would liken you to the, you know, pretty little thing we made. Really? Did you not catch what he just said, that all the nations are as nothing before him? He holds the sea in the little part of his hand, and you are actually likening him to the fabrication of your own hand? Idolatry is insanity. And yet, Calvin said, my heart is an idol-making factory. 24-7, it's open. <laughs> That's too convicting. Look at verse 21. Do you not know, have you not heard? Now remember, he's speaking to his people here. Do you not know, have you not heard? Has it not been declared to you from the beginning have you not understood from the foundations of the earth, it is he, notice not it, not, not your idol, he who inhabits above the circle of the earth. And its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. <laughs> he, I love the word pictures and how he paints this. It is he who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to inhabit. It is he who reduces rulers to nothing. He's right, Nebuchadnezzar. 
in, that te- in the side margin there. Who makes the judges of the earth utterly formless. Scarcely have they been planted. Scarcely have they been sown. Scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth. But he merely blows on them and they wither. And the storm carries them away like stubble. To whom then will you liken me that I would be his equal? And here we go. Says the Holy One. Brothers, let us be careful. Let us be oh so careful to never put any ruler any leader out of proportion in place to Yahweh. Whether they be somebody we like or somebody we detest, let us be careful not to put them out of balance with what the scripture says in reference to the king who says, I make him into nothing if I so desire. Twenty-six. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these stars. The one who leads forth their host by number, he calls them all by name. All the stars? Yes, all the stars by name. Because of the greatness of his vigor and the strength of his power, not one of them is missing. It's one of those passages, my dear brothers, that I, I have felt some conviction and some challenge, and I, I give the challenge to you to put just that portion to memory. Because what, what a profound tonic for our soul as Christian men that that's our God. That's the sovereign one. And so let me move pretty quick and, and draw this to a, Pre conclusion. <laughs> My brothers, this is the true God. This is the one in all of his majestic glory and awesome power. This is certainly no weak, intimidated God. He is absolutely perfect in all ways and wholly righteous in all that he does. But eventually, eventually, Everyone that begins to view the Lord rightly will begin to look inwardly as well. How could one like me ever even imagine approaching such a God? How could, any, how could, how could a guy like Dan, with sinful inclinations, nasty once, and a black heart, I'm speaking about pre-conversion here, one who has a desire uh, for sin, one who the scripture refers to as dead spiritually. And the one I've been talking about up to this point, that this little Dan Mason is going to approach that. There's no way. There's no way. See, it it does not throw me off guard, and I don't think it does for you either, that Isaiah's first response is, I'm ruined. I don't, that's not that shocking, right, brothers? That's not that shocking. If you know who you are and you read and see him in all of his majesty, that's not that shocking. But see, what happens far too often is we bring God down and put ourselves up. So we see the wrong God. We see an idol, some preacher, or even in our own heart, we've fabricated, so that way I don't feel that much different than him. And what the word does, oh, what the word does with the Spirit of God is to come and say, you've missed it, Dan. Let me show you who our God is. And in the seeing of who he is, you'll see who Dan is. And you will remove yourself from any kind of dirty, self-righteous thinking. One Puritan said, I come to the Lord and I drop all of my bad deeds. But I also drop all of my good ones. And I cling to the righteousness of Jesus alone. 
because there's no other thing I've got. I've got nothing to approach him by. And so this question of how could a man ever approach this holy God, the greater our understanding of God, the greater our knowledge of ourselves, the more dead and lost and sinful we see ourselves for who we are, this is absolutely no hope in approaching him based on what I have done. I doubt there's anybody in this room, and if you would say this, visit with um, Sean. <laughs> My hope in prayer, brothers, is that in your thinking tonight, none of you, absolutely none of you would say, I'm basically good. I'm a pretty good person. My unsaved friends that I love with all my heart have told me that. If there is a God and he's fair, I'm good. I've got this made. That's an idol. The scripture says perfection or damnation. And you go, I have no perfection. That's right, you don't. So what does God do? This is what is mind-boggling, right? The amazing gospel is that the sovereign of the universe says, then I'll approach you. Because you can't approach me. So what I'll do is I will come in the flesh. And I will lay my life down and my perfect justice, my perfect mercy, my perfect grace, and my wrath will be on a tree for all the world to see. And I will call you unto myself. You can't come to me, so I'll come to you. And God in his sovereign, sweet grace awakens a dead man. See, Lazarus is such a beautiful picture of what happens in our conversion. He didn't say, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus said, uh, no. Or, Lazarus, help me out here. No, the sovereign of the universe says, Lazarus, now, boom, dead man, alive man, and he comes out. Our righteousness, brothers, the only means by which we could ever even imagine approaching God is in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. If you're writing down notes, Romans 5, 1 and 2, <coughs> 5, 1 and 2 Romans 10, 1 through 4, and Philippians 3, 7 to 9, these passages are passages that speak directly to a foreign righteousness, a righteousness that is not your own that you come before God. See, this is what's so amazing when we talk with our unsaved friends is they make statements like this. Well, Dan, I may come hear you preach sometime, but the walls are going to cave in if I walk into that building. Or, Dan, I, we may come to church sometime, but, whew, man, it's going to be hot in there for everybody else, especially me, so I don't know if we'll do that. What are they talking about? Well, in their mind, they think the church people are the holy people, where in reality, the church people are the people who recognize they're not the holy people. The church people are the people who are the holy people because of the perfection of Christ. And the absolute, um, you have absolutely given up on your own righteousness. We're not holy because we did good stuff. We are set apart. We are sanctified in Christ. So think about this, brothers. That God that Isaiah just described with all of the magnificent description sought you and provided a way for you to approach him. And this is what, this is what just stumbles me in my thinking at times. Not in a stoic, stiff kind of relationship, but the level of intimacy that has allowed us to the Father so that the scripture says to come boldly before the throne of grace. Just think, brothers, think of that curtain. And the holy of holies is opened up. Go in, go ahead. Go in, go to him. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we are at peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, and we have been granted access to him. 
fallen sinful creatures can freely approach the living God with boldness on the basis of the righteous Lord. See, this is the problem. When you make God smaller and weaker than what he, than what he truly is, and you make yourself better than who you are, you remove the necessity of the gospel. Spurgeon said, don't touch the jagged edges of the gospel. Let him go through, for there's the power. So let me close with two things, and then I'll pray. Number one, I, am, I do not ever want to take for granted the fact that there could be an unsaved man at the conference this evening. Perhaps a brother that has played church for 25, 30 years. And you fooled a pastor, you fooled your wife, you fooled some friends. But sitting here tonight in your heart of hearts, you're saying, I have not approached God through Christ. I plead with you. If you're looking to yourself to please God, you have no hope. If that offends you, ask why that offends you. Because my hope would be you would love that reality that you're approaching the Father through the Son because of the Spirit's work in your heart. Number two, to those of you who are my brethren, I realize in age, my fathers, my really older brothers, Would you say that you're seeking to cultivate a high view of God? And you can move the word high and you can put the word true if you want. I mean it the same idea. Are you, are you in pursuit of cultivating a true understanding of the Lord? Or in the crevices of your life have you enabled your own kind of idol? That that's really not what he's like, but you're way more comfortable with him being like that. The study of God's self-revelation, not allowing your particular wants to shape your view of God, a profoundly submissive heart to that which is revealed by God, a continual prayer that, Lord, Make yourself known and help me to deal with what I find. And putting yourself under those who are under the word of God. Putting yourself under those who are under the word of God. All I mean by that is that you have good quality teaching in your life. <clears throat> it's always fascinating to me, and this will make you self-conscious, so too bad. But um, you ever noticed car Bibles, I call them car Bibles, where you leave your Bible in the back seat and that stuff that the Bible manufacturer calls leather bends like this from the heat. Does your Bible look like that? Now, perhaps it looks like that because you're just a forgetful fellow and you use your phone. Okay. Or perhaps it looks like that because it's my book I carry into a certain building on Sunday morning and I'll see it again the next Sunday. How on earth, how on earth do we think we will be conformed to the image of Christ when the word of God is never opened in front of our face? How easy is it for Dan Mason to fabricate an idol and say that's God if I do not make myself consistently with my nose in the word of God? Because, brothers, here's where we find what he's really like. So I leave you with that question tonight before I pray. Is there a possibility you're worshiping an idol of your own making? What you think about when you think of God is the most important thing about you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your love, how you confront us 
like a good dad. And Lord, I feel freshly confronted by this message tonight in my own heart. Father, perhaps there's pieces to my own theological um, understanding where I have put you in a certain place that makes it easier for me. And so, Father, I, I want to pray for my own soul this evening and for my dear brothers in this room tonight. Father, would you put in us a submissive spirit to conform our thinking, our worship, our understanding to the revealed word of God, the revealed truth of God within your word. God, that we might see you rightly. You are holy. You are holy, holy, holy. And Father, the reality that you have approached us, adopted us, indwelt us, promised us a glorious eternity at the expense of your son's death. Oh, Father, make us a grateful people. Enrich our souls tonight with a fresh glimpse of the King that you might be glorified in the hearts of your sons as their head hits the pillow this evening. In Jesus' name, amen.